that involves taking meandering streams and straightening them, lining them with concrete, building dams that, uh, where the reservoirs uh, submerge valuable and important uh, habitats from the ecological point of view, and so on. And the, the issue extends beyond the water management and water engineering. The highway engineers were pilloried in the press. Urban redevelopment as a concept was a total failure. But what would happen is that the urban planners said, we'll go in, we'll take these run-down areas close to downtown, and build high-rises, build uh, multi-use projects that involve retail as well as housing, and uh, we'll kind of clean them up, spruce them up. In the process, all the poor people that used to live there were driven out. In the process, many cities lost access to valuable parks. For example, I used to work in Hartford. I live, I worked two blocks from the river, and I could see the river from my office, but I would have to walk a mile to get access to the river, because there was a highway that blocked all the pedestrians from the river. Similarly, in San Francisco, there was a highway called the Embarcadero, which, unless you are a resident of San Francisco or lived here, you wouldn't know about. But the citizens of San Francisco in the 90s actually voted to tear it down. It was so uh, alienated to the, to the citizens because it blocked their access to the bay. So there were all these engineering projects that led the Congress in 1969 to the data bill called the National Environmental Policy Act. Now, this particular act started out as really a mandate to the agencies of the federal government to behave more appropriately in regard to the environmental effects of their projects. Because, you know, the Corps of Engineers, for example, is building these uh, projects that involve effects on wildlife, aesthetic effects, and so on, but they don't see their mandate as taking care of all of that. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, for example, is back then, it doesn't exist any longer. The Atomic Energy Commission, for example, is giving permits to nuclear power plants. And if you go to the Atomic Energy Commission and you protest, they say, but you know, this power plant is going to release hot water because the cooling system in the power plant is going to release hot water to the stream and uh, adversely affect the stream. They say, well, we're not in charge of that. We're only in charge of radiation. That's what we're concerned about. Some of the other agency is in charge of that. Now, this was before the birth of the EPA. So it would be the Federal Water Pollution Control Agency is in charge of that. We're not in charge of that. So there was a lot of kind of people pointing at others and so on. There was no unified position on the part of the federal government to deal with environment. So the Congress said, well, we're going to pass a law that essentially makes all agencies responsible for the quality of the environment. And when they passed the law, they, as a result of interventions by a professor from Indiana named Linton Caldwell, uh, who urged the Congress to say, don't just tell the agencies that they should have as a policy to respect the environment. You have to cause them to do something. And so what Caldwell did was to cause the Senate to revise their bill and to include in it a provision that had about just a few hundred words that required the preparation of an environmental impact statement uh, as a basis for discussing the impacts on the environment before a project went forward. Can you get the picture? So now, what does this mean in 1970? It's quite fascinating to be uh, well, it was a fascinating period in general, but it's quite fascinating to see how the bureaucracy dealt with this. Because now, for example, before a highway agency could give money, the federal highway agency could give money to a state to build a road, they had to prepare a statement. And the statement had to say, well, this is a proposed road. Here are the bad things that are going to be associated with it. Uh, of course, the agencies all want, also wanted to talk about the good things associated with it, and that was fair game. They produced a statement. The statement would then be reviewed by the public, discussed in draft form. The public would then respond and the draft would then be revised based on the public response, and then the agency would have the opportunity to proceed with its plans or modify the plan based on the information that it received. The idea of this law is related to the, the notion that knowledge is power in a sense, that if the agency has an understanding of the actual effects 
that are associated with this project as a result of doing this analysis, that they would revise the project to try to reduce the adverse effects. This concept is called mitigation, is the idea. Mitigation of the adverse effects. So that's the game plan. So the law uh, was implemented. It was the first bill that uh, Nixon signed into law in 1970. It was implemented with a lot of fanfare. But the agencies, of course, didn't really know what it was, this thing they were supposed to prepare, called an environmental impact statement, because it had never been invented before. I mean, they just didn't know what it was. And so they did what you might do if you were a student here at Stanford and you didn't really want to do it, but you had to because it was required for the course, and the paper is due on Monday and it's Sunday night, and you throw something together and you stick it out there and hope that the professor will give you at least a passing grade. So that's what they did. Now, what they didn't bank on was that there was another law called the Administrative Procedure Act. And that other law allows you and me, any citizen, to sue an agency of the federal government if they don't do their job. So now what we have is a lot of D-minus papers called environmental impact statements floating around. It's 1970, it's 1971. And if you're an environmentalist, and there were two groups that had just been formed, the Natural Resource Defense Council, late 1960s, and the Environmental Defense Fund, now called Environmental Defense. Some of you may know that they're massive organizations today. Back then, there were a bunch of engineers, scientists, lawyers, economists, you know, in the storefront. I mean, there were just like three or four or five or six of them. And now they're enormous organizations. Uh, and they said, well, we could use the Administrative Procedure Act to get rid of these D-minus papers and force the agency to do a proper job. So that's what they did. So there was lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. In fact, in the 1970s, there were about 1,000 environmental impact statements prepared. 100, approximately, were based on court action. There were about 100, there were more than 100, on average, more than 100 suits per year uh, around this act for failure to comply uh, throughout the 1970s. So it was big good. Now, Here's what happens. You pass a law, and all of a sudden, you're getting sued left and right. So what do you do? You turn to the lawyers in the agency, and you say, what do we have to do to win these suits? So now the lawyers are telling the engineers and the scientists and the urban plans and so on, the people that are preparing these suits, they're telling all these people, what you've got to do to win these suits is the following things. We looked at the case. <coughs> And what the case law is telling us, because there was no, this was all, you know, the case was coming out, judges were making rulings. Oh, this is inadequate because, oh, that's inadequate because. So the lawyers are gathering all this stuff up and passing it to the people that are preparing the statements. So the people that are preparing the statements are saying, okay, this is, these are the rules of the game. If you want to get a passing grade, this is how you have to do it. So all of a sudden, the whole process is being driven by lawyers. Not engineers, not scientists, not social scientists, but lawyers. Because the lawyers are saying, if you want to win in court, this is what you have to do. So now the documents are getting longer and longer and longer. Uh, they're getting more and more complex. They're loaded with jargon because they're not written to inform the public. They're written to win in court because chances are well, one out of ten you're going to get sued and you want to win in court. So everybody gets good at preparing documents that will be bulletproof when you get to this, you get to and when you get to. Just to give you an idea of how out of control this has become. In uh, probably around 2000, plus or minus a year or two, Stanford prepared an environmental impact statement under the California law. Uh, it, not Stanford, but it pays for consultants. It, it cost more than a million dollars to do the job. It was for the extension of the Sand Hill Road, which used to stop in a parking lot, and now it goes to El Camino. So the extension of San Hill Road to El Camino, senior housing, and an extension of the shopping center by about 20%. It costs more than a million dollars. <coughs> Just the traffic study costs a half a million. So now we have, uh, now we have uh, 
Hey, welcome. You've heard this story before, but I'll tell some new ones before you leave. Okay. <laughs> you get my time. Okay, so, so anyway, now we have this document that cost a million dollars to prepare along with the process of public involvement. When I picked up the document with its appendices, I, I'm not kidding. I wondered, will I get a hernia from trying to carry this around? I mean, this thing, the package itself was in a big box. It weighed quite a lot. I mean, I almost wanted to get a little push cart to take it back to my office. Who did this? We, we, we queried people about whether they read it. We queried the city council of Palo Alto. We queried a lot of citizens. Almost nobody read it. Why? The document came very late in the process. By the time this document was prepared, everybody in the community knew all about it, for one thing, because they had been following the action. Uh, the people that were giving it were just giving it to see if it would reinforce their position because so much work had already been done on it. As far as the citizens were concerned, you know, this project was, you know, Sam had it's not going to change its mind. At the most, it's going to use this document to mitigate some glaring adverse effects, only because the state of California, the law under which this was uh, prepared, requires that if it is possible to mitigate in a reasonable, with reasonable cost, then you must. So, the short story is, well, this document is coming out very late. People already know the issue. The document itself is totally unreadable. <coughs> Believe me, it is totally unreadable. I teach a, a section on uh, transportation, on traffic impact assessment. When I looked at the traffic impact assessment, I couldn't read it. It didn't make any sense. A former student of mine was in charge of it. Okay? So I, 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 I said, come down, talk to the class, I'll take you to the factory club, you'll have a drink. So we're at the factory club, we're having a drink. And he said, tell me, why is it that this document is not readable? And he said, they didn't pay us enough to make it readable. They paid us to make sure that it was technically adequate. Okay, so you get any picture? Now, this is just one example. But if you go back throughout the whole 1970s, 1980, 1980s, it's repeated time and time again. The document comes out late. At the most, there's a little bit of mitigation that goes on. Uh, the public has trouble reading the documents frequently. And the process is just not working very well. But the main thing that people are finding is that it comes so late in the process that a lot of the other options are foreclosed. In other words, so the Corps of Engineers to present a project, they're going to say, well, the dam height could be X feet or X minus 10 or X minus 20 or X plus 10, but they're not saying, well, what are the alternatives to flood control that we could, you know, what are alternative measures for dealing with flood control or hydro generating energy? What are the other strategic things that we could be doing? They're not saying any of that. And the reason they're not saying any of that is because it's so late. You know, I mean, they know what they want to do at this point. They know what project they want. They wouldn't prepare an environmental impact statement if they didn't know what project they wanted, because in the impact statement, they have to say, describe the proposed project. And I can describe the proposed project until they have one. By the time they get to a proposed project, they've done all the technical studies, they've done all the economic studies, they've blown completely their planning budget. So people say, what we need is something that is more at the level, of, a more strategic level. This is way too late, this project stuff. Now the project stuff is called, in, in the rest of the world calls it, project level environmental impact assessment. In the US we say we're doing an environmental impact statement for a project, but we're doing, in California they use a different term, we're doing an environmental impact report for the project. Okay, so now you got the big picture. What some of the difficulties are here. So people start inventing an alternative. And in California, the alternative was invented very early, and it was called a programmatic environmental impact report. And the idea was that under California law, as modified by the courts, if you were going to prepare a land use plan for a city, or modify a land use plan for a city, or worry about annexation of new land to a city, you would have to prepare an environmental impact report. Now, this is getting close to what the rest of the world calls a strategic environmental assessment or a spatial plan. So we're not talking the level of individual buildings. 
We're talking about doing an assessment of the concepts associated with this land use plan. Okay, you with me? You got the picture? All right, so during the 70s, California was a leader because they were required by California law. And they were doing the equivalent of strategic environmental assessment around strategic plans. Now, a parenthesis. The rest of the world, of this innovation in the countries of the world, at that time, and these numbers are going to be low, there were more than 80 countries that had a or an administrative decree that set up a requirement for environmental impact statements that were similar to the one in the end by these. Virtually all the systems, like the World Bank and the Asian Development and so on, they required home that the, the presenting alone has to prepare. So, between the countries or the industrial that either laws or regulations or and the World Bank, which is just a you find in your world, but either you're a very highly you have your own rules, and many developing countries, by the way, have their own rules as well. Uh, or, or requirements. But if, even if you don't have requirements, you still have countries that don't have requirements are taking money. Yeah. How does the EPA ensure that the reports that they're getting are unbiased? Well, that's a great question. Now, the EPA was not formed until that disclosed. Okay. Now, the what the EPA so when the EPA was formed, I was not by the law. They want the EPAs have a role in this process because they are part of the public comment period. So when a document is prepared in draft, and this is really the issue, the issue of bias that you raise is answered by this process. We're working in the San Francisco Corps of Engineers, which is just a campus, and we're going to put in some measures for flood control. Now, the question is, uh, well, there is an issue. They have a card. They have quality of the document, and they have to replace the project. Okay? And they will should be stopped through everything you can to stop it to fantastic here and so So they got a five point scale. They generally let's say they won't is the coordination takes place. So if they were going to embarrass other engineers for like I said, you know, simple. What they would do instead of embarrassing them with this report guide that's giving them a test, uh, they would contact the core and negotiate. So, issue a rating on this, we're going to say this project is miserable, and this is why, and we would strongly encourage you to modify and so on, and the court is not wanting to get a death grade to the but by the time the report in response. That doesn't happen very often, because by now, everybody knows how to do it. So we don't be a question of bias, okay? The reason that bias is not a big problem is because the process is totally transparent. That is to say, everyone, Everybody in this room could get a copy of this report. Everybody in this room, individually or collectively, could comment on it. And if we thought that the Corps of Engineers completely missed the boat, either they forgot an obvious alternative, or they messed up the analysis of the habitat, whatever they did, we write a letter. The Corps of Engineers is required, by law, to respond to all the points that we raised. Now, does that eliminate bias? Oh, it's getting pretty close in the sense that there's an exchange. You know, if we went, if we thought the hydrology was wrong, we could go to Professor Kinnitas and say, did they use the right flow type? Did they use the right uh, mathematical models here? What can we say? And he said, well, you know, read these materials and you'll get some ideas what you could tell them that they should have done. And then you're saying, okay, and no, so he's got some legitimate complaints here. You know, and Professor King, he, he might himself write a letter. Well, all of a sudden, this is getting embarrassing for everybody around. And so the Corps is going to want to respond, and he do. I mean, after all, he might work for the Corps of Engineers. These people are not evil. They want to do it. Sometimes they go astray. Uh, but this process, you know, is alerting them, you know, if you haven't used the state-of-the-art models here, I mean, this is, you really messed up here. And so they'll come back and respond in that way. If they do a job that says, essentially, ah, well, private kids need us maybe right, but we don't have the money to do this, so we're not going to do anything in response. We'll just say, well, uh, it's a matter of professional difference uh, with Professor Kidneys and so on. Well, now we have an opportunity to go to court. Because they are 
legally required to have an adequate document. So we would go to court and we would say, well, we have our expert that says this is completely inadequate as an assessment. And the judge is looking, Professor Kinnis' brief, the argument that why this is an improper analysis, listening to the court response, of course the court would lose. My colleague in the civil engineering department is going to win. And the judge is going to say, do it over. Okay? Now, the last thing in the world the Corps of Engineers wants is to do it over. Okay? So they're going to do anything they can to avoid a do-over. Because a do-over means they're going to stall out their process. So they're going to probably do a decent job in the first place. Look at Stanford, okay? Stanfield Road Project. Why did they spend a half million dollars on a track study that nobody could read? They knew they were going to be sued. They figured they'd be sued on traffic. So they wanted to have a traffic study that every traffic engineer in the country would say, well, you know, I might have done it differently, but it is the state art. You know, professionals can differ, but it's up there. It represents us. That's what we need. Because as a result of the Supreme Court ruling in the 80s, you cannot sue and win on the basis of, I don't like your project. Or, your project is not green enough. Or, your project is not green at all. The only way you can win is to show that the effect's inadequate, they left stuff out, they missed a procedure, they didn't circulate the document when they were supposed to. Any procedural flaw, including an inadequate document, they're done. And guess what? They've had 35 years to figure out how to get on procedures on an inadequate document. So, they rarely lose. And now, fewer and fewer cases come to the courts. Yes. But it's all degenerated now because it's so legalistic. See, it's not the kind of give and take that you might anticipate, and it's very late. Yeah. So, are you saying you can't sue on the basis of environmental impact, or just not? You can't sue because you don't like the project. You, I mean, you can sue, but you're not going to win. You say, you know, there are really adverse effects here. Because the law doesn't say that uh, we want the Corps of Engineers or the highway agents or whoever build projects and propose and build projects that don't have environmental effects. It doesn't say anything of the sort. What it does say is, we want you to respect these national goals that have words like uh, ecological integrity and recycle, reuse, and so on. But the courts in the 80s under the Reagan administration, it all went all the way to the Supreme Court with the environmentalists arguing that this guaranteed the way the structure of the law, it guaranteed that they should be responsible for coming up with projects that don't do these damages. And the courts found against them. And when the Supreme Court finds against, there's no place else to go except to try to revise the law, but that was impossible because they wouldn't pass this law today under any circumstances. Because nobody anticipated when they passed the law that they would be creating all these lawsuits. And of course, they wouldn't revise the law because the environmentalists would go totally bananas and say, you're going to revise the National Environmental Policy Act by taking out the only part of it that led to anything? No way. So everybody's kind of stuck. Now, as I mentioned before, California does have a slight wrinkle in the sense that California law, which is stronger than the national law, modeled on it, but it's stronger. It says, if, it is, if there is a significant adverse effect that the project proponent is required either to offset the effect, get rid of it, minimize it, and so on, or explain what you can't. But if you can explain what you can't, like it would cost more money than building the whole project to fix this thing, or we would love to do it, but we can't for these reasons, do that. Charge ahead. So these laws, both the California law and the national law, don't guarantee green projects. They were never intended to. They were intended. Knowledge is power. What they were intended to do was to have to have the uh, well, you can follow me. Maybe. Uh, get somebody to put it down. But he said that what they said was what we want is information. And if we get information out there, the agencies will respond to it. And they have. They have. Believe it. Uh, even though I'm making it all sound pretty bad, we did a study one time, we went to Caltrans, and we, we were trying to document what this law did to them. And they said, well, you know, I can't, you know, we did interview people, they said, I can't really put my finger on it, but things have changed. For example, we would never oppose 
a really bad question. We wouldn't think of it. Because if he would get embarrassed, we wouldn't think of it. Uh, there, is a, there is a provision in the law that says if you have a project where you have adverse effects, you go back and you modify the project so you eliminate all those adverse effects, you can issue a declaration that says there are no adverse effects, and you can skip the public involvement part, which is very, very expensive, the public comment process. So the agencies have figured out, you know, well, I'll get a project, I'll see these bad things, I'll fix them, and then I'll issue a statement that says no bad things here, and then I'll build my project. So there are hundreds of thousands of these every year, they call environmental that uh, just go boom, you know, they start the whole process. These are all changes in agency behavior. The real value of the law, in my opinion, and the opinion of some others, not too many, is not producing these statements, but changing behavior of the agency. Very difficult to document. Because you change the culture of an agency, how do you document it? You know, what would you have done without this? But we talk to people. And you look at the projects. They don't come out with terrible projects. They're very careful because, you know, it's all public. It's transparent, complete transparency in the process. But notwithstanding all those good things, the process, the process suffers because everything is coming too late. If I'm the, if I got a project, San Francisco Creek, I'm just talking about the dam, I, plus or minus 10 feet, that's all I'm offering you. That's what we come back to, the strategic idea. So, you pioneered, in fact, California pioneered in strategic assessments for land use plans, which was terrific. Now, many other countries are doing that. In fact, there's a law, the European Union, they don't issue laws, they issue environmental directives. Directives is a kind of regulation that is the force of law in the EU. And they issued in 2004 a directive. So first of all, in the 80s, they issued a directive that required environmental impact statements for projects, just like the U.S. law. But in 2004, they're way ahead of the U.S. here. They issued a directive for strategic environmental assessment. That is to say, environmental assessment for spatial plans and sectoral programs. Now, what's a sectoral program? For example, the Dutch government has a program for planning its energy facilities in the next 10 years. The energy sector. It's an environmental assessment for the sector plan, for the sector program. But, yeah, who evaluates or who is able to evaluate the Well, in California, that's another great question. In California, uh, these uh, assessments, whether they're spatial plans, sector plans, although we don't do them. You see, in the U.S., in the U.S., first of all, the, the number of strategic environmental assessments under the rubric of pro programmatic, in the U.S. as a whole, under the national law, is minuscule, less than 5% for sure. In California, it's a little heftier, the percentage is a little heftier because of the requirements of land use plans, updating plans, new plans, annexations, and so on. It's a little heftier, but not that great. The large majority in California are all about projects. But in the U.S., even though the law specifies that it's a close reading of the law, we don't do sector plans. I mean, we don't do assessments on sector plans. Uh, so the leaders are in other countries. Now, in the U.S., the evaluation process is based on this public review. That's it. You say, who evaluates the public review? For example, in principle, if Stanford has a project, Stanford could hire the consultant itself. And produce the document. You know, in other words, I, I hire these two folks in the front row here sitting on this couch, and I just produce the document. And they're thinking, oh man, I do a good job for Stanford on this, and I'll get more work from Stanford. It'll be terrific. I know what Stanford wants to say. I'm going to compromise. They never do that. Because if they compromise and put out a bias report, they're going to get slammed by everybody. They'll for sure get to the court. And they'll never get another job. Because, oh, those, that's the consulting firm. They got sued because of this blatant bias. So the checks and balances in our process is based on public review. Now, let's take countries in Europe where the process is different. The leader in Europe, up until a recent change in government, was the Netherlands. The Netherlands set up an environmental commission that reviews the whole process. The commission has a stable of experts, dozens, 
on different facets, you know, ground hydrology, surface ground hydrology, uh, ecosystems of different types and so on, wetlands. They got this group, university professors and consultants, that signed on to this, I'm available, call me to meet. And so they get a document like the energy sector plan, they have their roster, they go out to the experts on two occasions. On the first occasion, they go out for the preparation of what's called the terms of reference. Now, um, in the U.S., we don't use this term, but let me describe what it is. Uh, in the U.S., we call it the scope of work for a consulting contract. So, uh, if I've got my two consultants here in the front row, and they're going to do a project a level assessment for me, what the scope of work is going to be is that I'm going to have my environmental staff here at Stanford prepare to make sure that there are certain things that they're going to cover in their analysis. And depending on the level of detail that I give them, it's going to affect the price of their bid. I mean, if I give them a big job and I'm telling them to do a lot of things and use certain kinds of models, get right down to the detail, I'm tying their hands, and they know, because they're good consultants, they know what it's going to cost to do that, and that's going to affect their bid. And it's a competitive bidding process, so when we send out the request for bids, we're going to send out the scope of work. So all the consultants know it, they bid on it, so. Well, in Europe it's called, and most other countries call the terms of reference. So what the uh, Dutch government does is it has this panel of experts. They select them based on the project. They, they got dozens of people. They pick the people, they bring them together, they have a little expert committee. They put terms of reference go out. Then they set the price. The Environmental Commission selects the consultants, or maybe the agency selects the consultants, so they do it in Canada. Consultants do their work. They produce a report to the public review. The same group of consultants is brought back together to prepare an assessment of the document. Say the sector plan for energy, the assessment of the document, they submit it to the head of the commission. The head of the commission writes a, a report based on a consultant's review and submits it to the government. When it's evaluated by the government, they have the opinion of the Environment Commission, which has the expertise of all of these groups. We don't do any of that, but that's what they do in the Netherlands. Very uh, sophisticated process. In Canada, they have a special agency that reviews these documents. Different from the Environment Ministry. Special agency just for these documents. So, now, you're getting the idea that this strategic assessment can do some good because it's at a higher level. And they even have this concept that they call tiering, which is to say, if you do a strategic assessment, say, for the Stanford Land Use Plan, by the way, which there is one for the Stanford Land Use Plan, <coughs> then you have individual projects. You can refer to the strategic assessment, in California we call it programmatic. You can refer to the programmatic assessment while you're doing the project level assessment. So, for example, let's take the construction of this dormitory area. I think it was about four or five in Sterling? Yeah. Four? In Sterling Quad? I imagine it's a quad or four. Okay. So let's take Sterling Quad. In the uh, strategic assessment for the land use plan that was done before Sterling Quad came into existence, you might have said, well, I've been a circle there, it might have said dormitories. But maybe it didn't have too much about the dormitories. So now we have this dormitory project. It looks like a pretty hefty project. Uh, car trips going to be generated, the students going to be going there, and so on. So, I don't know if they did one for this. I imagine that they didn't. But it, if they were required to do one because the impacts would be significant and not assessed in the strategic plan, when they did the assessment, they might say, we're not going to look at the cumulative of this project on the overall traffic patterns. And the reason is that the strategic assessment, the program assessment, focused on traffic, which is a the assessment that was conducted for the campus plan focused on traffic. That's why every October, when you go out there, you see these traffic counters. They're out there counting your life. Because when this strategic assessment was done for the campus plan, way back, not the latest one, but the one before that, you said, oh, wow, you're going to generate a lot of trips if you build out to this level. When you generate these by asking you for mitigation, the intersection, the help. It turns out that gardening and signal you know, all of the work with signals that you have to do and so on, getting those bus terms, it gets kind of expensive pretty quick. And Stanford would rather graduate students get us to count them uh, so that they could take those passes 
Uh, it's no accident, for example, that the goodies offered, now you don't know because you're four years, one year, and probably some of you are only year, your first or second year, so. But if you look, if you did a study of the goodies offered by the Stanford Transportation Office to the faculty, staff, and students, and maybe in some sense the baddies, to the study the baddies and the baddies and men. But if you look at the trajectory, starting 20 years ago, okay, the goodies have increased. You get vests for your bicycle. If you ride your bike, you'll get a permit. You'll get lights. You'll get uh, Caltrain passes. You'll get free passes for the buses. <coughs> you'll get to be in the carpool club so that, oh, somebody calls out from the school and says your son or daughter is sick, your staff or your son or daughter is sick. You get to get a free kid ride to the school, pick up your child, pick your child home if you're carpooling. Okay. All of these goodies have been added a little bit at a time to the traffic counts or driving the goodies. Because if those traffic counts get near that threshold, Stanford says it's going to be a lot cheaper to give away more goodies than it is to drive the intersection. Cut down on the trip. Provost recently sent a letter to the staff and said, how about instead of coming in at 9, but then you come in at 7, leave at 3, others day come in at 11, leave at 8. We've got to get off peak. You know, we want you driving off peak. You even got a mandate telling departments, you know, department should encourage your staff, you know, try to work it out and so on. Disrupt the whole working schedule, the whole place. <laughs> try to get them what into an intersection. <laughs> they do. But then, if you're a freshman, I don't think you can park anymore, right? Well, for the longest time, I used to be the head of the transportation committee. We try to get uh, this freshman parking deal, you know, because they said, well, what are we going to do? It's impossible. But as the pressure built, well, what are we going to do? Pressure no cars. So if you look at uh, what it costs for a nine months parking permit in A, probably about 450 bucks, I would guess, uh, in that neighborhood. Between four or five hundred dollars. Now, I mean, that price goes up every year. See? Even for staffers, it used to be, you know, for a seat permit, it costs almost nothing. Now it's getting up there. It's probably more than a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. More than a hundred bucks. So, so these are all responses to a condition that came out of an environmental impact assessment that said, at the strategic level, that said, well, we don't know what's going on in this building, but campus-wide, if you build out, we're going to have problems with the community. Okay? So it really did some good at the strategic level. And we call it tiering. When we build this dorm, or we build the clock center, which would be a better example. I can't remember if clock center had one of these or not. There's an incinerator near here someplace. You ever see it? It's on this road, I think. If you go out a little further, there's an incinerator that takes out this place from the medical school. It's not far from here. Yeah. That way? Okay. Not far from here. That incinerator had an environmental impact statement. And in that impact statement, it referred to the strategic level. and said, well, these kinds of issues were covered already. So there's certain efficiencies in doing a strategic assessment for a land use plan and then having the impact statements for the individual projects refer to it. Now, what I originally came to talk about, which I will just mention uh, in passing, <laughs> because we had to build up to it, okay? Uh, is I originally came to talk about uh, strategic assessment at the policy level. So now you see we have strategic assessment for plans, Largely land use plans for cities and regions. We have strategic assessments for sectors. In the EU, in China, for example, China requires this by law. There's a law in China that says you've got to do it for projects, you've got to do it for plans, you have to do it for sector programs. It's required by law. We don't have it in the US. But in China, yeah. We have it in the US, by far, in terms of the law. Implementation, a little spotty, but. They got into one, they're working, you know, to improve their procedures. I mean, after all, it took us years and years before we got to where we are, which is a dysfunctional system because it's all totally driven by lawyers. Now we have these huge documents and nobody reads. But in any case, it takes time to work it out. Uh, so the Chinese are in advance. The Europeans are certainly in advance. The Dutch are not in advance. Uh, but most European countries are working now to implement this EU directive from 2004 that requires environmental assessments for all plans and programs. Now, the place where countries have not moved forward concerns environmental assessments for policy. This is the 
top level. I was a consultant to the Chinese government when they were doing their revision of their law. They asked me, I said, in my opinion, I don't think you should go for policies yet. I think it's too advanced. I think you should work out, you know, the strategic assessments of plans and programs is enough to buy it off. In the future, maybe you can deal with policies. Why did I say that? Well, if you look at the experience that we have on environmental assessments and policies, it's driven largely by the Netherlands and Canada in terms of the experience base. Example, 1990 in Canada, the government of Canada, Prime Minister in Canada, issued a regulation that said any proposals for new laws that come before the Canada, for new laws, they have to have an environmental impact assessment. Okay? We, we call that policy level environmental impact assessment, or policy level strategic environmental assessment. That's the kind of jargon that people would use to describe that. The Netherlands, they have something similar. Now, I brought with me, because I did a little study of this, I brought with me, uh, let's see where is it? Nope, not there, not there. I brought with me some juicy quotes. Let me get some juicy quotes. I brought with me some juicy quotes that I'd like to read to you that were from the self studies that were done in Canada by the, uh, a, a person called the Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development in the Office of Auditor General. Of Canada. This would be like the GAO in the U.S., the General Accounting Office. This is an agency in Canada, like our General Accounting Office, that <laughs> studies in an objective way the performance of the government, the government agencies. So, the, in 1998, the first assessment was prepared of the response of the various government departments in China, I mean, in Canada, to the requirement set out in 1990 to prepare an environmental statements or impact assessments for all bills that come to the capital. Okay. Just a little bit of background. In 1993, the Canadian government issued detailed guidelines on what was expected in these assessments. So they have, by 1990, they have uh, five years of circle politics. Here is the commissioner writing an open audit in 1998. He said, we have not develop guidelines or direct guidelines in total. Conducted a follow-up assessment. In 2000, the commissioner writes, departments were not making sufficient progress. The fully correct deficiencies we noticed. So, saying, okay, the commissioner does an audit, says, you've been naughty, you have a requirement, and most of you are not paying much attention to it, and this is what we expect, because we see these deficiencies, we expect you to respond to the deficiencies, Two years later, comes back to the follow-up audit and says, you remain white. You still have not done your job. 2004, the commissioner does the latest of the year. He, In this case, the commissioner is focusing on actual performance between 2000 and 2002. He's picking up these statements, reviewing them and so on, doing interviews and so on. He says, in general, departments and agencies do not know how the strategic environmental assessments they have done have affected the decisions made, and in turn, what the ultimate impacts on the environment are. Moreover, audit results, quote, taken together suggest that most departments have not made serious efforts to apply the directives. Okay? Now, the process is kind of closed, so there's not a lot of public participation in this process. They're discussing proposed legislation, one of the difficulties in this process is if the proposed legislation is assessed early in the process, when they're just debating it for the initial, well, it's going to change because the policy process evolves. If it's done late, you're coming here and saying, we're going to do an assessment now, but the results of the assessment aren't going to affect anything because you already worked everything out. So these are some of the, process, the, the problems that the auditor uh, the commissioner here has pointed out. And there's some of the difficulties with strategic environmental assessment at the policy level. The policy process is not transparent. Policy making is not transparent, for one thing. So you don't have a lot of public access and public discussion. And it fluctuates and changes rather rapidly. So as a result of the push and pull. 
So as a result, this is in still a primitive form, quite primitive. Well, we have three or four minutes before 8 o'clock, and I've been yakking and yakking here. So uh, I can talk some more, of course, but I was just wondering if we could simulate a question or two. Yes, please. Um, you were talking about how much Haiti other countries now have those guidelines and these documents. Yes. Um, and since the public is the main, uh, the main group of people who, who protest about, about, or in the U.S., in the U.S., in the U.S. So that would mean, especially the people who go to uh, the country through the World Bank would be like, let's say, India. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. that, that assumes a certain level of literacy, right, for the, for the... Well, if you depend, if your process depends on, you see, the U.S. process depends on the public review to maintain quality. The Dutch process doesn't really depend on it. They have public review, but they don't depend on it because they have consultants. So it depends on how you design your process. But your point is well taken. If an important driver in this process is the public participation, then you would need to have a public that was interested, ready to spend the time, and so on. But, you know, I believe in what Jefferson said. Jefferson said, you know, People are pretty smart, and you don't have to go to college to understand that a road that's going to come through your neighborhood is going to adversely affect your, your daily life. And you can, under the circumstances, say to the agency, have you taken account of the fact that you're busting up this neighborhood? And the agency, in some cases, might say, well, no, not really. We didn't know you cared that much. And we're going to put this road here. Uh, for example, to give you a case in point, uh, since we started out in the Italian scene, uh, we can close that Italian scene. The Italian American community in Boston is in a place called the North End of Boston. Okay? And there's a road that came and sliced the North End and cut it off from the rest of Boston. You wrote a book about it, about the road and what it did to the It's called the Urban Villages by Herbert Cam written many years ago. But we didn't have our own assessment process. If we would have, then the planners would have been much more sensitive because there would have been a protest from the community. And you say, well, are they traffic experts? Well, they're not. But, you know, they can point out to agencies things that the agencies traditionally ignore. They do a poor job. And that's some of the value of a transparent process. And, yeah, I admit, though, and I, you know, I agree with you, that in some countries, Either the government, like the government of China, for example, was pressed by the World Bank to open up its process to ordinary citizens. The government of China said, at the first, it said, well, we have public participation. We invite university professors to come in. You know, it's not just the government. We invite experts. And the World Bank said, well, why don't you invite citizens? Well, what do the citizens know about this? That's why we have the experts. They can participate in a meaningful way. The citizens can't participate in a meaningful way. Now, the World Bank keeps present. They keep present, present, present. Now China has a public involvement process that's associated with their new environmental impact law. Yeah? Um, who in the U.S. has become an interest in the world of Japan? I mean, how, is, is that a problem? Like, are there ever a lack of people to... Well, certainly. I have been involved in public meetings where I showed up with Ten Stanford students, 300 donuts, and enough orange juice to carry the crowd, and, you know, 20 people show up. We had more Stanford students to facilitate the breakout groups than we had people. <laughs> yeah, sure that happens. Sometimes it's a fault, in that case it's my fault. Uh, poorly designed uh, outreach. Uh, sometimes uh, people just don't know about it. So, there are other projects. But if you have a project, let me tell you something. One thing, if you have a project that's controversial, that people are really concerned about, they put in the time. And the reason they put in the time is because they know that they have a voice in this. It's one more slice at the apple, if you will. Because normally, in any, in any city, if you have a project, there's going to be, and the city government is involved, there's going to be a hearing. But in this case, you have a special kind of hearing. You have a hearing with a document that's supposed to inform you. And if the community is interested in acting it, and the community has to be notified. Uh, they, we find that they do participate. You know, not always, but often. Often enough to make that process workable. And these are just ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens. Ordinary citizens just like you and me. Because there are plenty of parts of the environmental impact statement 
that I'm not a specialist for, but I can go out and it gives me, a, it gives me an opportunity. For example, some citizens groups will actually hire consultants. If they want to stop a project bad enough, or they'll go to the Sierra Club and plead with the Sierra Club. Can you help them? The Sierra Club will enlist their members, many of whom are specialists, to help the citizens deal. So it gives more opportunities. And uh, it's effective in that sense. There are a couple of hands up, I suppose, yeah. Are there any groups, though, that like go through and take these documents and publish like readable covers for popular consumption? Well, I mean, I think that comes out in the discussion period and the content period, but I don't know if any one example can tell you what happened. In Sand Hill, I met with some of the, the uh, councils. And I said, you know, I think this document is, I don't want to say worthless, but it's difficult to deal with because it's too complicated for ordinary citizens. And they said, yeah, you know, we felt the same way. He had staff prepare the staff of the city, uh, city workers, the city government staff, prepare summaries that were digestible and make presentations to us so that we could understand the issues. They appreciated the existence of the assessment and they generated access because they were the decision makers after all. They generated access by having staff with their summaries that were, you know, digestible in plain language. Which, I mean, I'm a firm believer that it always can be done, doesn't matter what the issues are. That people can debate and, and discuss even highly technical issues because it shouldn't be presented in a way that people can understand. That's your job if you're an engineer, it's only your job. You're supposed to be assisting in decision making, you want to be able to present information in a way that the people who have to make the decisions can appreciate, so they can understand what the trade offs are. You know, they may not understand the details of your analysis. That's why you want an open process, because if your analysis is faulty, you want other technical experts to be able to weigh in and say, well, it's faulty for these reasons. You can't expect citizens to do that. So, uh, what do you think? Are we at the <laughs> tail end? I don't want to keep people away from their homework, because I know the professors complain, saying that, uh, you know, I think this is supposed to go to their homework, and they sat around this lounge talking to you. Uh, I'm happy to stay around a while. So if you want to talk further, you have to do well, it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
my hospital. So I said, let's work together and let's figure out how to, how to do what you do, but serving the 